Welcome to you all on this reflection on the sermon delivered at Corona Worship on the 11th of July 2021. Today's message is about unity. So let's begin with the readings. The first is from Amos chapter 7 verses 7 to 15. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built through to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, What do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, Look, I'm setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I'll spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined with my sword and I will raise against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words. For this is what Amos is actually saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy any more at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd and I took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. And Now in the New Testament, in Ephesians 2, 11-32, we read, Jews and Gentiles are reconciled through Christ. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. You were without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near to by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law and with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross and by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. May God bless to us these readings from his holy word. Amen. Thy hand, O God, has guided was written by Edward H. Plumptre, Professor of Pastoral Theology at King's College and was published in 1864. It's a popular hymn which you should feel very free to join in.
The reflection is entitled Unity Between Us. Amos has a vision where he sees a wall built with a plumb line and is asked by God, what do you see? Amos responds with the item right in front of him. He had the plumb line in his hand. God, however, has a different use for the plumb line. God is setting a religious and ethical plumb line in the midst of the kingdom of Israel and to see how they stand. And sadly, the people just failed to measure up, mainly through being not respectful. The religious and ethical plumb line demonstrates their inability to live by God's law. Amos then challenged, when he was challenged, validates his prophetic words by noting that God called him while he was tending his flocks to prophesy to Israel. He spoke only the words the Almighty has directed him to speak. In Ephesians 2, Paul speaks of the relationship between Gentile and Jew before Christ came. In today's reading, he is drawing the contrast between the life of the Gentile and that of the Jew. The first of the great divisions between them was the Gentiles, unlike the Jews, weren't circumcised. To say that the Jew had an immense content for the Gentile would be an understatement. They commented that the Gentiles were created by God to fuel as fuel for the fires of hell, and that God loved only Israel and all nations that he made. Bartley wrote that the gulf between Jew and Gentile was absolute. If a Jew married a Gentile, the funeral for that Jew was carried out. Such contact with a Jew was the equivalent of death. Even to go into a Gentile house rendered a Jew unclean. And before Jesus, the barriers were up. Afterwards, the barriers were down. In Hebrew, the Messiah came to mean the anointed one of God, the, un the expected king whom God would send into the world to vindicate his own and to bring in the golden age. Even in the bitterest days, the Jews were never doubted that the Messiah would come, unlike the Gentiles, who in Jewish opinion were deemed to have no such hope of a saviour. How things have changed. To the Gentile history was a progress to nowhere. To the Jew, history was a march to God. But with the coming of Christ, the Gentile entered into that new view of history in which all mankind is always on the way to God. Israel was different from most nations in the sense that their only God, king was God. Israel was a theocracy. When Psalm was saying, I will extol thee my God and king from Psalm 145, they meant it literally. To be an Israelite was to be a member of the society of God. It was to have a citizenship which was divine. Remember that you are a citizen of God and you speak to the people of God. Israel was absolutely the covenant people. The Jews believed that God had approached their nation with a special offer. I will take you from my people and I will be your God, Exodus 6. This covenant relationship involved not only privilege, but also an obligation. It involved the keeping of the law by the chosen. If God's design was ever to be worked out, it must be worked out through a nation. God's choice of Israel was, wasn't favoritism, for it was choice not for special honour, but for special responsibilities. But it gave to the Jews the unique consciousness of being the people of God. We need to remember that Paul was more than aware of how the Jewish nation perceived itself under its relationship with the Gentiles. Before his conversion to the new religion, he was known himself as the Pharisee of Pharisees. But all that was to change at the arrival of Jesus Christ, where he gave the Gentiles the same hope that Israel had always had in God. Now, there's no doubt that the Jew hated and despised the Gentiles. It was a big ask of Paul to prove that hatred is killed and the new unity has come to both sides. He says that the middle wall of the barrier between the has been torn down. 
which is a reference to the temple in Jerusalem. At that temple, the first court was the court of the Gentiles and was the only court in which Gentiles were permitted. The next came the court of the women, which was separated from the Gentile court by a wall. On that wall were tablets, which announced that if a Gentile proceeded any further, he was liable to instant death. The Jews weren't the only people who put up the barriers and shut people out. The ancient world was full of these barriers. Cicero wrote much later, as Greeks say, all men are divided into two classes, Greeks and barbarians. The Greeks called any man a barbarian who couldn't speak Greek, and they despised him and put up all kind of barriers against him, according to Bartley. It's a bit like the attitude in some parts of our country, where new people who come to a new area are denigrated by the term incomer. I read in the local paper when I used to live a where I used to live, about the sad passing of a lady called Fiona McWhorter, and I quote, who passed aged 93 years. Although not a local, she moved to the town where she was three years old from the neighbouring town a mile away. As I just indicated, this problem of barriers is by no means confined to the ancient world. Rita Snowden quotes a truly relevant saying that Father Taylor of Boston used to say, there's just enough room in the world for all the people in it, but there's no room for the fences which separate them. In any society without Christ, there can be nothing but the middle walls of partition. Christ is our peace. It's in a common love of him that people come to love each other. That peace is won at the price of his blood, for the great awakener of love is the cross. The sight of that cross awakens in the hearts of men all nations love for Christ, and only when they all love Christ will they love each other. It's quoted in Romans 10 that Christ is the end of the law. What Christ actually did was to end legalism as the principle of religion. He was a very devout Jew and followed the Jewish law. In its place he put love to God and love to men. Jesus came to tell mankind that they can't earn God's approval by, keep, by the keeping of the ceremonial law, but must accept the forgiveness and fellowship which God, in mercy, freely offers them, a religion based on love that can be a universal religion. The unity which Christ achieves is not achieved by blotting out all racial characteristics. The tendency has always been that when we used to send missionaries abroad to produce people who will wear European clothes and speak the English language. But there are indeed some missionary churches who would have all their congregations worship with the one liturgy used in the churches at home, the liturgy being the orders of service. I believe Jesus never intended that we should turn all mankind into one nation, but there should be Christian Indians and Christian Africans whose unity lies in their Christianity. The oneness in Christ is in Christ and not in any external changes. The work of Jesus is to show all of mankind that God is their friend and that therefore they must be friends with each other. Reconciliation with God involves and necessitates reconciliation with man. Through Jesus, both Jew and Gentile have the right they have the right of access to God. The unity in Christ produces Christians whose Christianity transcends all their local and racial differences. It produces men and women who are friends with each other because they are friends with God. It produces men and women who are one because they meet in the presence of God to whom they all have access. And that is one of the main reasons, one of the many reasons actually, of why communal worship in a meeting place or church is so important. So Paul says to the Gentiles, you are no longer among God's people on sufferance. You are full members of the family of God. Alternatively, it's through Jesus that we are at home with God. The principle is highly commendable, but people being people don't necessarily embrace the concept even today. How many here have ever felt a member of something but not necessarily a part of it? 
that's what must not happen in the family of God. And that's what should never happen in a church. In the words of Marty Hogan, all are welcome in this place, a helm we use, but sometimes fall short on actioning the sentiment. It's not just about welcoming the stranger. It's also about accepting those in our congregations and community and accepting their views as valid in these times of change. Through Jesus, there is a place for all men and women in the family of God. It's only in recent memory that the church removed the barriers to who could sit at the Lord's table. Because when I was younger, churches could keep, would keep the communion table only for their their membership. God never does. It's the tragedy of the church that it's so often more exclusive than God. It's been long held that we as part of the body of Christ are like the stone used to create a building and the cornerstone that holds everything together is Jesus. That's what the church should be like. The unity comes not from organisation or, or ritual or liturgy. It comes from Christ and the Word. Where he is, there is the church. The church will realise her unity only when she realises that she doesn't exist to spread the point of view of any single power group, but to provide a home where the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Christ can dwell, and where all people who love Christ can meet in that Spirit, as we have done this morning. Amen. Will you join me in, in a short prayer? God, we are travellers in this world, but you invite us to be your guests. You lavishly offer us your hospitality and lovingly welcome us into your family. You invite us to share in the abundance of your kingdom. God, you have shown us that providing hospitality to strangers opens a doorway into the kingdom of God. Remind us that when we offer hospitality to others, we are receiving Christ into our midst and so fulfilling the law of love. We open our hearts to embrace the stranger, the friend, the rich, and the poor. We open our lives to offer a generous heart towards all. Amen. Thank you for joining me, wherever you may be. It's my intention to regularly share these reflections on the full services in the church online. So until the next time, God bless.